All right, praise the Lord. We are happy to be here another time in the house of the Lord where we pick up in our time of studying in the book of John. We commenced our study of the book of John a few weeks ago and we find ourselves today in chapter 1, John chapter 1. We haven't gone too far after since we start. Uh, we are in John chapter 1 and... and um, I think we are going to pick up from verse 9, is it? Verse, verse 8, I think we should um, pick up from. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, we bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here another time in your presence. Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands. We ask that your spirit will manifest itself in our midst that you pour out your anointing upon us. We ask of you today for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Lord, that our eyes will be open to your words, O God, and you'll make yourself known to us. Manifest in our midst there, Father, and let your glory be seen. Those who are on their way, bring them safely so we can come together, Lord, in your house and receive your blessings. Feed us with manna from above as we wait upon you today. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name, we ask these favors. Glory to God. So, in chapter 1 and verse 8 of John, it said, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So here we see um, John, the writer, the apostle John, the beloved disciple. He was saying here that John the Baptist was not that light. You remember from the beginning he identified Jesus Christ as the light. So he is making us understand here that John the Baptist, he was just the, the forerunner. He was the one that was preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't the light. And uh, it is so important that those of us who are representing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we must be careful that we make sure that people understand and people see that we are not the light. We are not the one that they should recognize. We have to be careful that we declare Jesus, that we do um, represent ourselves. We are, we are just uh, the lamp. John the Baptist was like the lamp that you put the uh, kerosene in and then you light the wick. But John the Baptist was not the light. Jesus Christ is the light. And it's the same thing that we, as I said, we have to be careful that when we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, that we make sure that we are representing Him and we are not um, doing it in a way so that we can be seen. We are just witnesses of the Lord and we have to declare the Lord. Just like how John the Baptist was not the light, we are not the light. Meaning that we, we, are, not, we are not it. And we are not to represent ourselves. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ who is the light of the world. So it tells us that he was not the light but was sent to bear witness of the light. Now what is happening here too? Uh, if you go over history and you um, try to understand what the writer was uh, saying here too. Uh, during the time when John the Apostle was writing, John wrote the book of John about 60 years after the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the last um, writer of the New Testament. And uh, John was very old when he wrote this book. He was probably in his um, early 90s. So um, they, in that time, uh, there, there was a group of people who were uh, portraying John the Baptist as more or less as Messiah. There was a cult group who were following John the Baptist. Even in the book of Acts, you'll find, I think it's Acts chapter uh, 20, somewhere around there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, met, where, where that song coming from? Uh, he, he met with a, a group of uh, people, of disciples, who were uh, after the baptism of John the Baptist. And uh, what was happening is that... Um, they, they were holding on to, to John the Baptist and they probably see John the Baptist as their Messiah, as their leader. And the Apostle Paul had us to 
redirect these uh, disciples of John the Baptist. So uh, apparently uh, there was a cult. There was a cult uh, who were probably trying to follow John the Baptist in those days. And uh, even as we look as, at the Baptist organization today, I, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 the people who call themselves Baptists, I think that they probably named themselves after John the Baptist also. So um, the writer of the book here was careful to proclaim that John the Baptist was not the light. And, you know, many of these uh, religions that we have today, some of the, the leaders of these uh, religions, for instance, uh, the Branhamite. I don't know if anybody ever heard about the Branhamite um, church. The Branhamite um, religion, they named themselves after um, the, the, the preacher or the prophet called Branham. Branham was a mighty man of God. You know, when I read and listen to some of his uh, tapes, he was a mighty man of God. And he never portrayed himself in the light in which his followers are portraying him today. Uh, the, the followers of Branham are portraying him as the last prophet. And, uh, you know, the kind, of, um, the, 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 the kind of prestige and honor that they give to Branham when he was alive, he never take that for himself. And, uh, you know, so that's why it is very important that when we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to be careful. It doesn't matter how much um, manifestation of the glory of God that is seen in our lives. We have to be careful that the record that we leave behind People don't get confused and figure that we are portraying ourselves as something that is so important, putting ourselves in a category that we're not supposed to put ourselves in. And uh, as I was saying, uh, apparently there was a, 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 a group of people who were trying to worship or maybe identify John as the Messiah. So the writer of John, he was making sure that he correct that and let them know that John was not the light. And we, we also, we have to make sure that we, uh, as we represent the Lord, we let people know that we are not um, it. We are not representing ourselves. We are represent the Lord, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. We are declaring the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Did somebody say something? Oh, okay. Verse 9. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. So the Lord Jesus Christ was not the light. He was the true light. As he said in John um, 15, um, talk about the vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. He is the true light. And um, all the light that we have in the world today is a copy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You take, for instance, the sun and the moon, it's a copy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The light that we have within us, our conscience and our intellect, it's a copy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So every light that we have in the world today, it's a copy of the Lord Jesus, who is the true light. And it said, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. Now, at the beginning of the discussion, uh, the, the, when we started the, the discussion in the book of John, I tried to explain, and because we come across uh, a, a verse in the early part of the chapter that deal with this um, one here in verse 9, uh, where it said, uh, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. And I was trying to explain that when it said, lighted every man that cometh into the world, some people interpret this to mean that God is in every individual. God is in every created being. And we have today the universalists who believe that people don't need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because they already have God in them. So we have to be careful that we don't interpret this. When it said that he lighted every man that cometh into the world. He's not saying that every person have God in them. Now, every individual have 
within them. God placed within them the ability to recognize and to acknowledge that they need God, that there is a God. There is a, there, there is a vacuum that God built within every individual. It doesn't matter how wicked the person is. Deep down within that person's uh, life or in their heart, they know that there is a God. Even though they did not, even the atheist, the man who, and the woman who confessed that there is no God, there is something deep down within them that telling them that there is a God. They may not want to admit it, you know, but there is something in every person that tells them that there is a God. But that's something that is in them, that is showing them and pointing them and letting them know that there is a God, that is not God. So we can't say that because he light every person that comes into the world, that every person have God in them. No, we can't say that. And this is the message that the universalists, there's a, a denomination that calls themselves the universalists, in a sense that they believe that every person is saved, every person is a son of God, a daughter of God. And that is wrong. We, when we when we born physically, we don't born sons and daughters of God. You have to become a son of God. You have to become a daughter of God. So this is not saying that every person have God within them. To get God within you, you have to acknowledge your sins. You have to repent. You have to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you. Invite him into your heart. He comes into your heart and he makes you a new person. So what is the light that John is talking about here that lighted every man that comes into the world? The light here that he's talking about is our conscience, is our intellect. Every one of us have a conscience. And when you do something wrong, even though you don't want to admit it, how many times, you know, I do something wrong and maybe say something wrong or make a bad move and, you know, I don't want to admit it, but deep down something telling me, that, that is wrong, you shouldn't say that, you know. And, uh, and uh, even though that thing telling me I, should, uh, I should, uh, shouldn't say that and, you know, trying to point me to guilt, I'll at times say, no, I'm not guilty. You shut up. You just keep him all closed. But still, our conscience uh, will tell us when we do something wrong. You know, and uh, our conscience is just like pain. Pain in our body, you know, all of us, we don't like to feel pain. But pain, there's a good side to pain. The good side to pain is that pain, when you feel pain, it alerts you that something is wrong in your body and you need to take stock. You need to check. You need to check up and see what's going on. It's, it's like a sensor that alerts you and tells you what something is wrong. You know, when you drive a vehicle and you see the check engine light come on, it tells you that something wrong. You need to take that vehicle into the repair shop and check to see what's going on. It's the same thing when you feel pain. It means that there is something wrong in some place of your body, and your body is alerting you to that. And it's the same thing when our conscience, when our conscience starts speaking to us and telling us, what you did there is wrong. It's the same thing like pain. It's alerting you and telling you that you're supposed to take stock of what you're doing and, you know, take heed to your ways. So one of the ways that he lighted every man that comes into the world is through our conscience. And then our intellect. God make every one of us intelligent beings. We are all intelligent. And uh, that intellect that God gave to us, um, it, 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 it make us become aware that there is a God, that there is a higher being. And that is what Romans tells us. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. That, you know, God created us in such a way that um, we... Every person that is created by God, they have that within them, that ability within them to know uh, that there is a God, even though they don't, they don't want to recognize Him. So we all are created with that intellect, and that intellect that we have, it will drive us or point us to, the, 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 to make that decision and to know that there is a God. So we have our conscience, and we have... Um, uh, our intellect. Now, because of the fact that God has given us a conscience and He has made all of us intelligent beings, it means that every one of us is accountable to God. 
You see, if God didn't give you a conscience and God didn't make you an intelligent being, it means that God was not in a position to hold us accountable. That is the reason why the Bible tells us that um, it's appointed on the man once to die, but after death there comes a judgment. It also said in Ephesians that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Every person will have to stand before God and give an account of themselves to him. And uh, as I was explaining a, a, a few weeks ago, we were talking about um, the age of accountability. And we were saying that uh, children who are within or below the age of accountability, if they should pass away, if they should die, that God don't hold them accountable God, through his mercy, is going to let these children enter his kingdom. You know, not because they are righteous, but because um, he, God is merciful. And these kids, because they don't reach the age of accountability, if they passed away uh, during that time, they will go to heaven. And it doesn't matter who their, their parents are. Even though their parents is the most wretched sinner, and that child die. God, through his mercy, is going to let that child into his kingdom. And as, as I was saying, we don't know exactly when that age uh, is up. I don't know if it's 12 or 13 or whatever, but God is the one that judge the child and know when the child reach to the age when they can acknowledge and they can recognize um, th themselves and know that they need to um, recognize uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we have to um, let our children know that. We have a lot of children uh, growing up in church, and they, you know, some of them, they reach, and I think they pass the age of accountability, 16 and all of that, and they still don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We cannot really guarantee that a, a child or a person that you know, grew up in that way and grew up in church and allowed time to pass without acknowledging Jesus as Lord, if they don't confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we can't um, give them any guarantee that they will enter heaven if something happens. So our children, they need to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Because if they die before they reach the age of accountability, I, truly, I, I don't know exactly what is going to happen. And we, we hope that uh, our kids will acknowledge him you know, before... Uh, they enter or death takes hold on any one of them. Praise the Lord. So God have the right to hold um, every one of us accountable because he placed within us that knowledge to acknowledge that there is a God, to know that there is a higher being over us. So that is what verse 9 is telling us about the light that lighted every man that comes into the world. It's not saying that every person have God in them, and they don't need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Man always look for easy way out. Always look for easy way out. Praise the Lord. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The he here that he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, the creator, the designer he was in the world, and the world was made by him. The Bible tells us that all things was created by him, for him. He is the creator. And the Bible says that the creator was in his creation. He was within his creation. And uh, the world knew him not. Now, I could understand here that the, the world in general who did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ when he came in the flesh. We could kind of understand um, some parts of the world where people didn't have a lot of knowledge uh, concerning the coming of the Messiah, and they did not recognize uh, the Lord Jesus. But when we, uh, when we and we will, come, we will come to it, when we come to uh, verse 12, when he talks about he, he came unto his own and his own received not, the, the, the Jews who had so much uh, privileges and opportunity to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to recognize Him as their Messiah, 
They have all of the Old Testament prophets and all of the Old Testament writings and stuff like that. They did not acknowledge him. But here he's saying that the, the, the world in general, the world, he was in the world that he created, but the world did not know him. And uh, that word they know, it's not just talking about, um, you know, knowing somebody in person or seeing somebody. They did not have an intimate relationship. They did not have an intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We today, we need to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know Him intimately, have a personal relationship with Him. And uh, He said that, um, so He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. You see, Jesus the Creator, who is God, came into the world that He created but he did not take on any special appearance. When Jesus was here in the flesh, Jesus wasn't glowing in the dark. You know, Jesus, you know, glittering and stuff like that. And you know it's Jesus because he had that hail over his head and all of that. You know, even when uh, Judas went to um, betray Jesus, G- uh, Judas had us to kiss Jesus so that they could know that he was the one. And what that is telling us is that Jesus was an ordinary guy. The Lord Jesus was, in his appearance, he was ordinary. And uh, when you look at the scripture, when you look at um, um, Isaiah chapter 53, according to Isaiah uh, 53, Jesus, and some people may, may, may take offense to what I'm going to say, but, you know, this is what the Bible is saying. When you look at Isaiah chapter 53, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his physical appearance, he was not the most attractive um, young man at that time. Uh, according to Isaiah, Jesus wasn't, you know, this handsome looking guy. Like when you look at those almanac pictures, you see they put the guy there with the straight nose and the long curly hair. And he's looking so um, handsome and stuff like that. That wasn't Jesus. Isaiah 53 said, when you look upon him, he, he didn't have the most comely form. Could you imagine that? You are the creator. If you have uh, the privilege to create a body for yourself, what kind of body would you create? I'm sure, bro, look at this big fat nose I have here. You know, if I have the chance to create myself, I'm not going to create myself with this big fat nose. You know, like I went, uh, two weeks ago, I went to the, um, <laughs> I went to the, the, the glasses place to order a pair of glasses, and this Chinese girl, she was measuring my face. Your head is too big. <laughs> you, 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 um, you're too tall, and your head is too big. And, uh, you know, if I am created myself, I'm not going to give myself this big head and this, you know, big fat nose. No, I'll try to make myself in the most, you know, nicest and most uh, attractive looking way that I can. But here we see Jesus, who is God, who is the creator, who created all human beings. He is coming into the world and he's taking a body. And according to what Isaiah said, he did not take the most um, handsome um, looking figure. No. Why? Because when he came, Jesus didn't want people to acknowledge him because of how he looked. Jesus didn't want to be recognized by how he looked. He wants to be recognized by who he is from the inside. He don't want to be recognized by how he looked. Praise the Lord. So he did not take the most handsome looking kind of form. So because he wasn't glowing in the dark, the people didn't acknowledge him because he didn't have a halo around his head. All this halo we see around the head of these pictures, that is not true. Some of these pictures that we have in our house, we need to throw them out. We need to get rid of them because that's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus wasn't a white man. Jesus wasn't a white man. Like how we see a white man in all the uh, pictures that we have of Jesus is white men they have acting as Jesus. And uh, uh, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't uh, a a white man. Jesus was a, he was a Palestinian Jew. Jesus have the same complexion like all of these guys that you have in those areas there now. He, was a, he wasn't a white man. He was a, he was a Palestinian Jew. He had dark complexion. 
and he wasn't black either. He wasn't, he wasn't a black um, um, Negro person like how you hear some people say, well, the, the true Jewish people is the black race. No, he wasn't like that either. He was just like one of those guys from that part of the world. That, that, that was his um, um, heredity. That's how he looked like. Go ahead, brother. Is it on? Yeah, why do they always portray him as a, as a white man? Well, you see, it, it goes back from Hollywood. It's Hollywood. Hollywood that, that doing that, that um, um, making these kind of um, decisions. You know, um, even way back, you know, before, it, it, it's, just, it's just a couple of years ago, you see they're allowing all these black movie stars to take on all of these major roles in Hollywood. Before, um, black people couldn't show their face. In, uh, in, 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 in Hollywood, unless they're doing some kind of demean kind of job, some kind of slavery, servant kind of role and stuff like that, they couldn't take on um, those kind of roles. So a role, I think it's uh, some years ago, some guy, they had some movie, or they was planning, I don't know if they, if they did make it, but they were making a movie, and they were putting Jesus as a black man, and there was an outcry. People didn't want that. They don't want Jesus to be no black man. So uh, it, it was, it, it was a, a, a move. Uh, it, was, it was a Hollywood decision. It's just like it's only recently they start allowing black movie stars, you know, to make, um, be in any kind of love scene with white women. Um, in years ago, you couldn't see any black guys on the screen and, you know, making love with a white woman. That was, that was not acceptable. And they just started to come around to these things. So that's the reason why you have all of these pictures that they have Jesus as white. And that's the reason why anybody who have a white Jesus in the house, they need to get rid of him. That is not Jesus. No, that's not no Jesus. Jesus is not no white man. Like, like how, um, you know, they want to portray him. And as I said, he's not a black, um, hard, hair kind of person like how some people want him to be either. Jesus, he was from Palestine. And Palestinian people, they have that kind of curly hair, they have that dark complexion, but they, they're not white. Praise the Lord. So he didn't give himself the best um, features. He didn't give himself, um, make himself look so handsome that people, when you see him, you'll know that that is Jesus. No, he didn't design himself like that. The Bible tells us he didn't, he take on to himself the form of a man, being formed in the image of a man. He become obedient even unto death. Therefore God also have highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So where we are now in verse, um, verse 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So uh, he came to the world. The world, the world which is, when he talk about the world here, he's talking about the world in general. But here, when he said he came unto his own, he is uh, identifying a certain group of people. And the group of people that he's identifying here as his own is the Jewish race. He came to, on, on, onto his own, the Jewish people, and his own received him not. The Jewish people who have all of the prophets and all of the Old Testament writings, and all of the appearance of God to them, their forefathers and all of that. They have all of these privileges and all of these uh, benefits that God has given unto them. They, uh, the Jewish people had more than 300 prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. And still, when the Messiah came, they did not receive him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know... Um, could you imagine that you design, let's suppose you design a, a, a vehicle. Uh, say so you design, you, you are the designer of the Mercedes uh, Benz vehicle, and you, you have one, and you take it and you give it to somebody, you know, just give it to that person, and uh, you out on the road, and you have the remote starter for that vehicle. You give that person the vehicle, but you have the remote starter. You could start it, and you can cut it off whenever you want to. And you're out on the road, and you're more or less just stranded, 
and you see this person coming down, you know, the road, and you out there flogging him down or flogging she down for them to stop to give you a ride, and they just drive past you, don't even acknowledge who you are, what would you do? Pardon? What would you do? You have the remote starter, the, 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 the remote starter in your hand, and you drive down the road, and you push out your hand, and for that person to stop, to give you a, a, a ride, to take you to some destination. And the person just ignore you. And, you know, they don't even recognize you in your Mercedes Benz. And you still have the remote start in your hand. Yes, I will turn it off. I will turn it off. And this is what happened when Jesus came. When Jesus came to the Jewish people. And when he came to the world. It's, it, it, I don't think it's a perfect analogy. But in a case like that, he had the remote starter in his hand. That's the reason why you see none of us couldn't be God. None of us couldn't be God because knowing us, you, you know, in that position as Jesus, and you came to in a world that you created, and amongst people that you created that are supposed to receive you, and they don't receive you, the first thing that will come to your mind is to just wipe them out. You know, get rid of them. Maybe design some other um, folks. But he didn't do that. Praise the Lord. He came onto his own. It's like you going back to whatever island you're from or country you're from. Go back to, you know, St. Vincent. Could, could imagine I go back to St. Vincent where I grew up in Lomans and, you know, my own people that I grew up with, you know, they just totally turned their backs on me. They were even recognize. How are you going to feel? You know, he, he came to his own and his own, the Bible said, his own people received him not. So the question is, because of the fact that the, his own people did not receive the Messiah, did not receive God, does this frustrate the plan of God? Was the plan of God frustrated? Did they, did they mess up God's program? Did the program of God mess up? Did God, was God frustrated? Was God disappointed in the fact that they didn't receive him? You see, all of this that is taking place here, it's in the program of God. Nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing don't surprise God. And uh, all of this was factored into um, his, his program. And uh, some people will use this verse and they will say, well, um, the reason why God decided to save the Gentile race is because the Jewish people reject him. That also is not true. That is not true. Um, the plan of salvation for the Gentile, it goes way back from the beginning. When you read the writings and you read when the Lord spoke to um, Abraham, I think it's in Genesis chapter 15, and uh, he, he told him that he's going to bless him, and all the nations of the world will be blessed through his seed. All of the different races of the world will be blessed. That is where God instituted the plan of salvation for every person, every human person. So it's not because Jewish people turn down the Messiah, why God decide, well, he's going to open the door to the Gentile. The door to the Gentile, or the preparation for the Gentiles to be saved, was already made. It was already there. But as many as receive him, in verse 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, you see, to um, become a son of God, the, the first thing here is that you have to receive him. It's a gift. It's a gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We must receive Jesus Christ. To become a son of God or a daughter of God, you must receive the Lord. He said, to them gave he power to become sons of God. So we become sons of God. Nobody born a child of God. You, 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 you don't um, inherit um, Christianity from nobody. 
You don't born from your mother's womb and you come out, you know, a, 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 a son or a daughter of God. It's not by birth, and we're going to deal with that in a little while. So you have to become, and to become a son of God or a daughter of God, you have to first acknowledge your sins, and then you confess your sins, you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, and then you are changed from the inside. As the Bible tells us, any man, any person who is in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things become new. So verse 13 tells us, which was born not of blood. So he's talking about people who received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They were not born of blood. In other words, you didn't inherit this from your father. This didn't come down through some bloodline. Salvation don't go down through the bloodline. Like sometimes you ask some people, are you a Christian? And uh, they will badge a question and say, ah, well, you know, my grandfather, you know, he, he, he was a preacher. Or oh, my father, you know, he was a preacher. And uh, my mom and my grandmother, you know, they were all Christian. But uh, that will have nothing to do with the question. Are you a Christian? You know, Christianity don't go, go down from parents to children. You know, every person has to acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So, it doesn't pass down through the blood, the, the blood line. Praise the Lord. God don't have no grandchildren. You ever hear that? God don't have no grandchildren. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, church. Um, yes. as, as you say, well, you become a son and daughter of God. You have to acknowledge God. You have to accept Him and then... Repent and of yes. your sins. Mm. So what if you do so? You become a, Christ, a, a chosen person of God. You, you, and then you, you backslide after. And start, you know, what would happen? Does you be a saved person still? When I return back to the church certain times? Well, you see, um, I personally believe. I don't believe in one save, always save. That message that some people preach in today, it's all over the television where they tell you, you know, once you save, you always save. That is not, in my opinion, reading the scripture, that is not really biblical. Um, but at the same time, if a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they stray away for a while, and they acknowledge themselves and they return back, God is going to refresh them. He is going to, they, 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 they will be saved. But you can't tell yourself that because you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you go into church and uh, you raise your hand, you come up to the altar, you pray a prayer, and you stay there maybe for a few years or whatever, and you just decide, well, I have it, I have it. You know, I have my insurance policy. And you just decide to, you know, backslide and do whatever you want, live whatever reckless, sinful life you want to live, and then tell yourself that you're going to be in God's kingdom. No. You're not going to make it into heaven. The Bible said, he or she who endure to the end is those people who are going to be saved. The, 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 the Olympics was some time ago there, and uh, you, you never see any runner who start out, and then he decides, man, I start this race, yes, so, you know, <laughs> that's all I need to do. <laughs> you know, I was there when they, when they, when they give the, um, the, the, the shot to go off, so it's okay, and, 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 and he go down maybe a, 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 a few feet, and he decided he, he's going to stop in the middle of the track. He will not be awarded anything. You have to go to the end. It doesn't matter how slow you reach to the end. Once you reach to the end and you cross the finish line, there is a reward for you. Anybody who say they repent and they acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and go back and live in sin, if they don't repent before they die, they're going to spend eternity in hell. We don't have no other way to put that. There is no such teaching in the Bible, once you save, you always save, and it doesn't matter what you do, you still save. That is not scriptural. Yes, I believe in eternal security. I believe if a person receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and you say to yourself, by the grace of God, I am going to make it. It doesn't matter what comes in my life. God, you're going to give me the grace to hold on to the end. Even though the storm comes, God, I believe you're going to give me the grace to hold on to the end. Even though my family turn against me, even though my husband turn against me, God, I believe you're going to give me the grace to hold on to the end and I'm going to make it. And you persuaded and you set that as your goal to go to the end, brethren. You're going to make it. We believe in eternal security. 
but not eternal security in a sense that when you say you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you just decide, well, you're going to just, oh, well, I have Jesus now, and let me just leave him at home. They put him on the shelf, they, you know, put him in the freezer, put him in some kind of closet, you know, and then you just go out and you live all kind of wicked life that you want to live and believe that when the time comes, you are going to make it into heaven, not going to happen. We need to read um, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, some people don't want to acknowledge that. Proverbs chapter 1 tells us that if you get all the opportunity that God offered to you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you don't accept, you don't take those opportunities to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and when you get uh, into calamity, that's the word he used. He said when your fears and your calamity comes upon you and you call upon God, just like how you turn him down when you receive all of those opportunities to acknowledge him. God, not me say that, that Pastor Duncan say that. God said that when you turn him down in those times that he reached out to you, when your fears and your calamity come, is the same thing he's going to tone you down and he's going to mock you just like how you mock him. He said that. So we don't have any guarantee to give anybody who tells himself, well, I'm going to wait until you know I'm ready to die. As soon as you see, you know, I'm going to breathe the last breath. I'm going to just call out, God save me. You don't have no guarantee that if you decide to turn down all the opportunity that God gives you to repent and you tell yourself you're going to wait until you're ready to die, that God is going to save you. There is no guarantee. And people try to use the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the, the thief on the cross as an example that they will make it into. I can't give anybody no guarantee that if you wait until you reach down to the end, that you call out for salvation, that God is going to part. Maybe it's going to happen, but we don't know. But why, why should a person... Allow that to happen. Don't wait until you reach in that situation. Now the Bible says, is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your heart. We will close at this point. Anybody have any final comment or question that you'd like to ask? You can do so before we close. Praise the Lord. Yes. Oh, when we talk about different doctrines mm-hmm. and people are having problems and they have, you know, preaching different things. But the scripture says, he says, some will turn from the faith mm-hmm. and giving heed to seeds and spirits yes. and doctrines of devils. Yes. And you know that they, 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 our, our faith today has been challenged by the powers of dark, darkness. If we as Christians still don't recognize that the power of Satan and the amount of power that he has, because if the, uh, the, the book of, um, I think it's, let me see, Mark. Uh, Mark, I think it's Luke chapter, tw- chapter 8. He talk about the sow and the seeds. Yeah. You see, when, 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 when the, 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 the seed is the word of God. Yeah. And they say, when they sow in somebody's heart, the, the yeah. enemy comes and they steal that word. Yeah. The Bible talks about that. Mm-hmm. So you see how much power the enemy have. Amen. So if you have power to even to take the word from your heart, you have the power to twist the doctrine as well. And this is why scripture is saying, so we have to be very careful and keep on the line of God, the, the, what the Bible says. Because there is a lot of strange doctrine in the world today looking just as the truth. And we have to be very careful. Well, that is true because the Bible says that even Satan is able to transform himself as an angel of light. That's the reason why I keep saying that even though somebody might be performing miracles in their ministry, that is not a guarantee that that person is of God. Um, the Bible still tells us that we have to test. You know the word try. When it says try, it means to test, examine. You need to examine. It doesn't matter. Even though somebody, when they pray for people, they fall to the ground. That is nothing. Fall into the ground when somebody pray for you. It, it, it's really nothing. And, and I'm telling you, there's a, there's a technique in, in getting people to fall to the ground. Eh? I, I personally believe if I want people to fall to the ground, I could, ha- I could have it done. It's a technique, especially women. And if you notice, they try it out on women. If, if, if one of these ladies come up here and pass down with this big hand that he have here, take that big hand and hold you here and start squeezing you. In a little while, you, you, you will go down to the ground too. But why, why would I want to do that? You know, I remember one time that when we used to be at Light and Life, this guy um, bent 
he, all of these ladies going up and, uh, you know, he squeezing them and holding them and they fall into the ground. And I was a leader in that church. And I was there and I see what he was doing. So my wife went up. She went up for prayer. And I, I, I decided that he's not going to squeeze her with his hand and make her go down to the ground. So what I do, I went up there and I had a big strong guy. I take my hand and I put it over my wife's shoulder like that. And he there trying to push. push. He, he can't push her down because I, I'm holding her. And, and then you realize that she's not going anywhere, so you just have to move on to the next person. So I'm not saying that you can't pray for somebody and they fall to the ground. But falling to the ground is not any guarantee that it's the Holy Spirit. We still have to try the Spirit. Brethren, you can go and somebody could pray for you and nothing. You don't see no lightning, you don't, you don't hear no thunder. And God could cause such great miracle in your life. It's not nothing physical. It's, it's something that takes place in the spiritual realm. But we so concerned about the physical manifestation. Physical manifestation is what running the church today. But brethren, God is a God that works supernaturally. He works in a way that with our natural eyes, we can't see what he's doing. But he's still working. So if you're not seeing something with your natural eyes, that is where faith comes in. And we need to trust the Lord. Praise the Lord. So what the brother said is true. We have to try the spirit. We have to be very careful, especially in these last days that we are living in. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, Okay, go ahead. Why why a man of God would uh, try to use such fake, you know, try to brainwash the people? Why a man of God would do something like that? Why is that? Why a man of God would do something like that? Try to... Say there is something that is there, and it, it, it isn't. A man of God will do that. Well, well, listen, would, uh, would hold onto somebody, squeeze the head, and push them onto the floor. Well, you see, because uh, uh, brother, that is what most people want. Eh? Yeah, I know. Um, the Bible tells us that God said in His Word, because of the fact that we, we uh, reject the truth, He is going to send us strong delusion. Okay. In other words, people will come in because we reject the truth. People will come in. And they will bring false doctrine. And once you reject the truth, you're going to fall. You're going to swallow that false doctrine. And you're going to tell yourself, it's the truth. It's a genuine thing. So uh, all of that is what the Bible talks about. And it, it goes right back to what the brother just said, that we have to be careful. We have to examine. We have to try. We have to test. Well, um, well I wonder how, how God look, like that, look at that. You mean on the individual um, yeah, side? How you, yeah, how you look at the pastor. You know. Well, anybody who try to do things like that. They are counterfeit. Yeah. You, you're not genuine. It, it's just like um, I was talking to uh, uh, a brother, a pastor this week, and I was telling, uh, we were talking about people who use the ministry to make money. Um, they, they're not genuine. They, 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 um, Jesus called them hirelings, and he, he called them um, in, over in, in, in Timothy, um, what, do you, what do you call them? Uh, they're working for filthy lucre. Yeah. People like that are not genuine men and women of God. No. So uh, they are false prophets. And it doesn't matter what manifestation you see taking place under their ministry. Once you're seeing these things taking place, uh, you have to know that these people are false. And don't, I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't leave here believing that Pastor Duncan is saying that every time somebody falls onto the ground, um, is, is a man pushing them down. I'm not saying that. But a lot of the, the falling to the ground don't have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. That is what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh boy. We touch off, we touch off a little thing here. No, no, no. We're in Sunday school. Yeah. Concerning this Holy Spirit, I was praying one night before I go to bed. I say, Lord, I pray sincerely. And the Holy Spirit of God told me, say, watch. He said, this Holy Spirit that a lot of people call in the name. Mm. It is not a simple thing. He said, this Holy Spirit is what created the world and created everything. It's not an easy thing for people just to talk, just simple. Mm. And when most people are saying that they have the Holy Spirit, he said, that is not true. He said, this thing is not an easy thing. He said, when you have the Holy Spirit, you could raise the dead, you could heal the sick, and you could do a lot of things with that. It's not an easy thing. He said, that is heavenly stuff. That's what he revealed to me. Well, well, we we'll see. Well, uh, as we will we'll touch on today in uh, in Ephesians, um, it gives uh, in Ephesians chapter five uh, some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. 
One of, one of the signs that he gave, and we'll touch on that today, that a person have the Holy Spirit, is when a person could control themselves. If you had the Holy Spirit, you could control yourself. If you had the Holy Spirit, you're not going to fly off the handle if somebody says something about you. If you have the Holy Spirit, you know, keep um, somebody anim- in, in, in uh, animosity. A person who has the Holy Spirit is somebody who knows how to control themselves. That is one of the four signs that you could identify that, that somebody had the Holy Spirit. It's not speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues doesn't say a person have the Holy Spirit. Right. As I said before, a lot of these people who are speaking in tongues, they're bad like wolves. And, you know, and, and, and speaking in tongues, those say that you have the Holy Spirit. Yes, speaking in tongues is one of the signs of the Holy Spirit. But it's not, um, the, it's not a, a genuine way to identify that somebody is filled. One of the ways that you use to identify that somebody is filled is if that person, the, 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 the Holy Spirit control them. You live in a controlled life. You are under the control of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, Brother Phyllis, I'll ask God's blessing as we close. Praise the Lord.